Apreciados amigos y amigas, que alegría que estemos todos juntos aquí en la Iglesia de Todos los Santos. Dear friends, what a joy it is that we are all here together this morning at All Saints Church. Uh, we're doing everything on Zoom for a couple more weeks. We uh, were looking at how things were going with the pandemic. Uh, we had some really good conversations. We consulted um, with our epidemiologists and, and, and other folks. And what we decided is we're going to, at least through the rest of this season of Epiphany, we're going to stay on Zoom, really just out of an abundance uh, of caution. We've developed some really good protocols for worshiping in the sanctuary together. And the stakes are really, really high. And, and we want to send the message uh, just really loud and clear that we are listening to public health professionals um, and that uh, we're doing what we need to do, which is leading and helping people be safe. So I hope wherever you are, you are being uh, as safe as you can be, um, that you're wearing a mask when you go out, that you're washing your hands. Uh, we recognize that home is not always a safe place for everyone. And so periodically through uh, our Sunday morning live here at All Saints Church, we'll post some resources. The National Domestic Violence Hotline uh, is an excellent resource for you to use and you can text. Uh, or call them and, uh, and, and, and their resources that if home is not a safe place for you. Also, the Trevor Project is a phenomenal resource for LGBTQ youth. Uh, and so if, uh, if home is not a safe place for you because of your sexual or gender orientation, or you're just lonely and having a hard time and needing someone to talk to, uh, give the Trevor Project a call. Uh, and of course, you can always, always, always contact us here at All Saints Church. Uh, it is so important for us to be together as a community, particularly when we can't physically be together as a community. Even though we're not worshiping in the sanctuary, uh, our Safe Haven program uh, continues. We have uh, 12 amazing members of our community living on our campus uh, at night, and we have lockers for their stuff during the day. We have now moved five people into permanent housing. Uh, and every time someone moves into housing, it frees up a space and someone else goes into the safe haven program. Uh, and so we're thrilled about that. Uh, also, our Sunday food ministry is still operative. In fact, this morning, uh, Erica Tamblin was out here and we gave out 53 boxes of food from Hope Kitchen. And so that continues uh, as we continue to live into our value of prioritizing the most vulnerable among us. Um, and speaking of that, when this pandemic started, uh, we at All Saints began to support some of the local organizations with which, with which we have strong ties. Uh, and every week we pick one and we call it a partner in love because that's what we are. Uh, and we want to ensure their good work continuing during these challenging times. Uh, our guest, which I'm gonna introduce in just a few moments is Ken Chasen, the senior rabbi at Leo Beck Temple. And given that our partner in love this morning is LA Voice. Uh, LA Voice is a ministry partner of both All Saints Church and Leo Beck Temple. Uh, it is part of an amazing national network of community organizers, of faith-based community organizing. It is a multiracial, multi-faith community organization that awakens people to their own power, training them to speak, act, and work together to transform our county into one that reflects the dignity of all people. Uh, great thing about LA Voice is it means that instead of just acting as one congregation, we act as one with communities of all different faiths. Uh, and it's one of many ways that Leo Beck Temple and All Saints Church are connected. And so our impact for the justice values we share is increased exponentially. So just go to lavoice.org. You can learn more about LA Voice. Their excellent executive director, Zach Hoover, uh, our own Juliana Serrano has done so much work with LA Voice. Uh, and we are learning uh, more and more ways to grow in partnership with them. So please learn more about them and um, donate, give generously to support the work uh, of LA Voice. Now, on to this morning's forum. One of the long time partners of All Saints Church has been Leo Beck Temple. And we're gonna talk uh, a little bit of the history of that partnership this morning. And it has its roots in two leaders. Rabbi Leonard Bierman, the founding rabbi of Leo Beck Temple, and George Regis, the longtime rector of All Saints Church. Uh, together, they also founded the Interfaith Center to Reverse the Arms Race in 1979, and Rabbi Bierman also served as rabbi in residence here at All Saints Church. Well, one of the great things about great relationships is they get handed down from generation to generation. When Rabbi Bierman retired, 
uh, Sanford Raggins, I think I'm getting that name right, or Reagan became senior rabbi. I apologize if I'm getting that wrong. Uh, and in 2003, Ken Chasen became the senior rabbi, and he has held that post for nearly two decades. And for us, George Regas gave way to Ed Bacon in 1995, and then I'm really the new kid on the block. I've only been here since 2016. So we're thrilled to welcome Rabbi Ken Chasen to our forum and uh, preaching this morning. And we're going to reminisce a little bit about the past, and we're going to gaze at the present, and we're going to dream a little about the future of our relationship, um, of the relationship of these two incredible communities of faith. Um, now, I want to um, tell you just a little bit about uh, Rabbi Chasen. As I said, Ken Chasen is the senior rabbi of Leo Beck Temple in Los Angeles, an outspoken advocate for social justice. Rabbi Chasen's writings have appeared in numerous books and publications, including the LA Times, The Forward, Variety, Thrive Global and the Jewish Journal, among many others. Uh, in addition, he is a member of the adjunct faculty of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, serves as national co-chair for Truach. The rabbinic call for human rights is an appointee to Mayor Eric Garcetti's Interfaith Leadership Collective and is a prominent Jewish composer whose works are regularly heard in synagogues and schools uh, around the world. Um, and if you haven't heard Ken play the guitar, uh, well, you're missing out. Uh, he's married to Allison Lee, the child development officer of Time's Up, and they are parents of three children. Uh, Ken, welcome. I so wish we could actually be face to face this morning, um, and and that day will certainly come. Uh, would love to start just sort of asking you a little bit about the the history. Uh, we were talking a little before uh, we we went on that George Regas, of course, passed away earlier this month at age ninety. Um, and even though it's kind of an overused phrase, it truly was the end of an era. George and Leonard Bierman and Maher and Hassan Hatout had a groundbreaking and life-giving mutuality of relationship. Can you talk about that a little from the Leo Beck perspective? And what has the relationship with All Saints Church and Leo Beck been? And talk a little about Leonard and George and then your own experience. So just anywhere that feels good, just kind of dive in. Well, first off, thank you so much, Mike, uh, for welcoming me. It's a, it is uh, a treat to be back home uh, with All Saints, even if we're doing it on screen. Um, it is uh, just a tremendous joy to be a part of the All Saints community this morning. Um, yeah, from the minute I arrived, I arrived, in, uh, as you said, in 2003. And at the time, uh, Leonard was, uh, they were both Leonard and uh, Reverend Regas, they were both retired from their posts uh, their longtime leadership posts at Leo Beck Temple and at All Saints Church, but oh, they were still going strong. Leonard was in his early 80s, I think he was 82 when I first arrived, and George, I think almost nine or 10 years younger, I think. Uh, so he would have been in his early 70s at the time when I first met him. And uh, from the moment I arrived, it, it was... I, it, not only from Leonard himself, but when I spoke with members of the congregation, the long timers, they wanted to understand the gift that was going to be bequeathed to me. And I, I really had only um, heard bits and pieces from my post in New York before I had arrived here. Um, but almost instantly, I, really, the, the, the All Saints community reached out, uh, both Reverend Regas and Reverend Bacon. Uh, to perpetuate that relationship. And yeah, the roots, uh, I actually, I knew a lot about this story uh, for years, but when Leonard was dying, um, he was at the hospital in the, toward the very end of 2014. And those of you who um, are uh, longtime fans of, of Rabbi Bierman, um, you may remember that he died um, on the morning of what was to be Christmas Eve. And we, our first real opportunity publicly to acknowledge his death um, in congregational community um, was that night when we were all together uh, at All Saints for Christmas Eve. Uh, and the, the, the bond was just an extraordinary one. He, he was known by, by title as rabbi in residence of All Saints Church. Um, and of course, Reverend Regis and Reverend Bacon um, had, and now you, of course, uh, Reverend Kinman, also uh, a, a deep place within the Leo Beck Temple community and familiar faces within our congregation as well. But when, when Leonard was dying and George and Mary came to visit, um, they brought a picture that I had never seen before, which was purportedly the moment where they met. 
they were together. Um, it was this beautiful picture on this sun splash day out on this big rolling lawn. I think it was at UCLA, but I can't say for certain where it was. No, it was here in LA. Um, what I can say is it was at a, uh, it was an exposition park, says Elizabeth Beerman Rothbard. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, it's nice to know that uh, uh, Rabbi Beerman's uh, youngest daughter, at least, is here with us this uh, morning and is going to be here correcting every mistake that I make. So Elizabeth, <laughs> welcome to you. And it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, in any case, Exposition Park was where the photo was. And um, uh, the photo, I believe, was taken in 1966. It was either 66 or 67, but I'm pretty sure 66. And you have this photo of a very young uh, Rabbi Leonard Beerman, very young Reverend George Regis together for the very first time. And uh, they were uh, joining in opposition to the Vietnam War. Uh, and it was really where that relationship began. And, you know, for so many of our longtime congregants, and I'm sure this is true at All Saints as well, um, there are uh, congregants of ours who really joined, not necessarily because they were even in the pursuit of a synagogue. They just heard that there was this rabbi um, mm -hmm. who in 1965, 1966 was already uh, actively opposing the war at a time where that was uh, certainly out of step with uh, what was uh, most familiar. And, uh, they wanted to be appended. They wanted to be attached to that type of leadership. And I know that that happened at All Saints as well. I know that the yeah. growth yeah. of the All Saints community was explosive um, during those years. And the same was true at Leo Beck. We, uh, back then, there was a, a goal at Leo Beck to keep things somewhat intimate. We ended up doing away with this, but the way, the strategy that they used at that time was actually to put a cap on the size of the active membership so Leonard could actually have personal relationships wow. with lots of folks, which meant that there were all kinds of folks who um, were uh, waiting to get in and ultimately did um, join our congregation, uh, but as it slowly grew. The idea was to not to keep them out, but to, to manage the growth in such a way that relationships could remain uh, in, of prime importance. And so that's where it began on that lawn at Exposition Park, thank you, Elizabeth, in 1966 <laughs> against the Vietnam War. That's, yeah, that's amazing. And um, talk, talk a little bit about what it was like for for you to come in and your relationship with George and then also with Ed sure. uh, and 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 the ways that that partnership between our two communities has has developed and changed through your time as senior rabbi. Yeah, well, well, Leonard, uh, from the get go was determined to make sure that I was blessed to know these giants uh, who uh, he was closest friends with. And so he was the one who introduced me to George. He was the one who introduced me to Maher. He was the one who introduced me to Hassan. He was the one who introduced me to Reverend Jim Lawson. Um, uh, so many relationships that became precious to me and some that still are. Um, of course, Jim uh, is still with us, thank yes. God. And uh, yes. what an extraordinary giant he is, the, the teacher of nonviolence to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and so he was also a part of that extraordinary team of faith leaders here in LA at that time. Um, so Leonard was really the point of introduction for me, but uh, Ed Bacon, reached out immediately upon my arrival um, at Leo Beck. Uh, he wanted to make sure that I understood that All Saints was still all in uh, when it came to our congregational community. And that took form on a number of different fronts. First off, from the, my very first High Holy Days, I arrived in July of 2003 and I was leading Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur services by September of that year. So just a, a few very short months uh, after my arrival. And there was Ed uh, and Hope. <laughs> out in the congregation there uh, to demonstrate not only support of the rabbinic transition at our congregation, but also a, an enduring love and connection to the congregational community. Um, all he had to do was walk in the door. There was an awful lot of love showered upon him uh, because of the depth of that relationship. Um, but it, it, there was a really sweet moment, important moment that took place very shortly after my arrival. I think it was in the first, I think it was in that maybe March or April of my first year, so it would have been in early 2004. 
the movie The Passion of the Christ um, was released mm. and became quite an enormous phenomenon, as many of you will remember. And it had uh, all kinds of really, really difficult uh, portrayals mm. of history uh, or misportrayals of history that uh, were endangering, uh, really felt very threatening to the Jewish community at that time. And Ed was the one who said, uh, we were just in touch with one another, kind of taking stock how things were going. Um, he did a good job of looking after me in the early going. And uh, I was explaining to him how much anxiety uh, the film had, uh, had created within our congregational community. Instantly, he went to work in creating, a, he the relationships in town at that point that I did not, mm -hmm. um, right. in putting together an extraordinary program that we jointly offered together at All Saints mm -hmm. um, that included, uh, it was actually the first time that I was uh, on a program, first time I met uh, Professor Dr. David Myers uh, from, oh, right. the, uh, from, he's the, the head of the history department over at uh, UCLA. UCLA um, right extraordinary partner for justice. And uh, he was a part of that panel. Um, Ken Turan of the LA Times mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, was a part of that program. Um, uh, some uh, scholars, both from the Jewish and Christian community as well, uh, to comment on the historical aspects. And this is the kind of thing that because of Ed, I was able to offer to my congregation like that. And I had nothing to do. I had no capacity <laughs> to make that happen. Um, Ed had the capacity to make that happen. And he uh, just swept me in with that big giant uh, arm hug of yep, his. Yep. <laughs> uh, and, uh, brought me into partnership on that program. And from there forward, it has been a friendship that uh, I think the two of us treasure. We've uh, done an awful lot of beautiful stuff together over the years. And still now, even uh, as uh, he's uh, moved on from All Saints, uh, the, the bond remains. Oh, absolutely. Well, and this is this is one of the gifts of this is, uh, you know, Ed did something wonderful, you know, for me, which is um, he, he flew out to St. Louis and we spent a couple days together um, sort of doing a handoff uh, for All Saints Church. Um, and I believe it's something that George had done for him. And, uh, and part of that was him telling me about some of this history and some of these relationships. Uh, but then I'll, you know, you reached out to me very soon after I got here. And I remember uh, going out and you took me out to lunch. Yep. Um, and we still haven't been to that Dodger game, but we're gonna do that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, but there, there is that piece, cause you're right, when you come here, you don't have any of the relationships. That's right. Um, and, and yet, you know, being invited into this community and, and Ebba Hatut was the same way uh, of just so incredibly gracious uh, of saying, you know, we're gonna help you, you know, build these relationships um, because it really, I mean, it's, um, it, is, it is so obviously so bigger than who is the senior rabbi at Leo Becker, who's the rector at All Saints Church. Um, it needs um, to it, be bigger. It, it, yeah. it, it, needs, it needs to be bigger than that. And so we are the stewards uh, of this relationship. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that I'm, I'm really, I, I'm, I'm in awe of is, uh, you know, multi-faith relationships have been, you know, they're, they're not uncommon right now. And we can sort of talk about sort of what they look like in various places. Um, back when Leonard and George and, um, you know, Hassan and Maher, um, that was, it was not as common, you know, back then, particularly, um, for clergy in major congregations like that to be as close and to stand with each other. Um, and, you know, particularly in a time right now where religious radicalism, um, is, is that really is, you know, as, as, as what happens in times of great societal change. Yeah. Um, there are always backlashes of radicalism and fundamentalism, um, and 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 you know different groups find themselves in in the crosshairs, um, and and there, there are things that you can think of as oh my gosh that's ludicrous, no sensible people would believe that like you know Jewish lasers from space and things like that. Except the truth is people do believe that. And, and, and conspiracy theories like that are huge threats to real people's lives. Um, and so I, it's, it's incredibly important, um, these relationships. Uh, and so I'm grateful. And, and part of what I would love to sort of think about is, you know, where, where, can, we, where can we go together? Because I'm, okay, I'm in my fifth year now. I feel like I got my feet underneath me. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, this is where it gets really, really um, exciting. Uh, want to stop for a second and say if anyone has any questions or things that they want to raise, use the Q&A feature in the Zoom and you can ask those. 
uh, and also the comment feature on Facebook and our, our greeters will be watching that. Um, one of the things that neither one of us saw coming was this pandemic. Yeah. And uh, we were sort of talking beforehand, I was saying it felt like overnight we stopped being clergy and started becoming TV hosts. Um, I, I'd love to just hear from you. Um, what is this pandemic teaching you? What, um, what of Judaism have you found yourself drawing on uh, to get you and your community through this and not just to get through it, but really to grow uh, from this experience? I'd love to hear that from your perspective. Yeah, it's such an important question. Um, it has been obviously for us no different uh, than I'm sure for your community and and uh, for all of our our faith partners and friends. Um, just an extraordinary challenge to take the riches of what being a part of a loving church does for you, um, and to create that gift somehow um, when you can't uh, see one another face to face, when you can't feel one another's touch, um, when on uh, the odd case where you can actually be in physical presence, proximity to another person, you can't touch them, you can't get too close. I mean, all of this is sort of subliminally pushing against all the things that we uh, and our faith communities, our faith traditions are built to teach. Um, and so it is, uh, if anything, it's become uh, all the more important to amplify uh, those teachings and to enable them to effectively kind of become countercultural, at least in the spirit, when the body can't do. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a great rabbinic uh, piece of rabbinic wisdom from the Talmud that teaches that uh, uh, whenever a person saves a single life, it is as if they have saved the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, it's also when one takes a single life, one taking mm -hmm. the entire world. And of course, right now, one of the deepest challenges we have is, uh, as always happens in giant moments of human atrocity, when hundreds of thousands of people lose their lives, millions of people lose their lives, it starts to become the numbers themselves become deadening. Um, they, they start to make it impossible to appreciate uh, the gravity of the one. Um, and so the telling of those stories and the acknowledging that it's not about 400,000 plus Americans, but each of those individuals, an entire story, an entire world. And so we've been attempting as best as possible, not only to lift up the stories of those um, who have lost their lives and have struggled um, especially. And of course we know that uh, that struggle has not been a fair struggle, at least not in this country. It has not been a balanced struggle. It's just been another reinforcement of all the layers of systemic uh, inequity uh, that take place in our country. It's just a further symptom of a deep disease uh, within our nation. And so um, the doubling down on our justice work uh, with regard to systemic uh, indifference and systemic inequity, um, this has uh, been a fundamental, uh, and there are so many teachings within the Jewish tradition that of course undergird that, especially uh, from, from the prophets, as of course we all study mm -hmm. together. Um, but for us, yeah, the goal has been most of all to uh, to come up with ways to enable people to feel uh, the humanity of this congregation and of one another. And we've we've done some, uh, you know, things that we wouldn't have necessarily imagined at the very beginning. I mean, the, some of it was obvious and easy, right? Well, I don't know about easy, but certainly obvious. <laughs> we needed to create a network of leaders of our congregation, not just from our board, but those who really are well suited to picking up the phone and calling every member right. of this congregation and right. doing so habitually. Um, you know, I think when it happened the first time, people were like, oh, that's nice. The synagogue is thinking of us and is calling to check in on us. And when it happened again, a couple of months later, and then another couple of months later, and then again, um, they started picking up on what was going on here. Yeah. Um, and uh, this was uh, a very systemic attempt to demonstrate that in point of fact, um, being a part of a community, uh, even uh, in moments where you can't be physically in place with one another, um, that that is, uh, has to be deeper and richer than what meets the eye. And it's certainly more than uh, service providing. I don't join the church. Maybe I joined the church because it had an interesting program I wanted to be a part of or a school that I wanted for my kids. Um, this happens in synagogues too. 
Um, but our, our, what we pride ourselves on, what we direct all of our effort to is while someone may have come to us to for a more utilitarian need to fill the need of something that church and synagogue does, um, we see ourselves as immediately on the clock to demonstrate that there's something missing in your life when you're not a part of religious community uh, in deep. And so uh, we want to demonstrate that from the get go. It's hard to do that when you can't be in yeah. place with one another. So the calls were a big part of it. We have a program that we launched uh, about a month into the pandemic called home to home yeah. which has been basically our vehicle we just proliferated all kinds of new program that was not a part of what we had done before and we really thought outside of the box of hmm. things that usually the synagogue would even consider doing uh, but what was going to be necessary at this time i'll give you one example one of the things that i'm yeah. doing weekly right now and this is it never crossed my mind that it would ever mm -hmm. be my rabbit but you mentioned before uh, music's a big part of, of my right. life and um i have composed a lot of uh, jewish music for prayer settings and school settings and summer camps and that kind of thing um but uh i had a career uh in writing music for television and film before i went to rabbinical huh. school i spent six years uh, working at uh, what's now sony studios in culver city um during those years and um uh yeah, I was in bands. I know all kinds of secular music. I have a pretty sharp ear. So if I know how a song goes, I can pretty quickly figure out how to play it and sing it. And so we, we initiated a program that takes place on Tuesdays called Ken's Campfire, where we <laughs> just, we just get together on screen. Uh, and uh, sometimes I'm taking requests. Sometimes I'm coming thematically related to something that's going on. Obviously, with the election and the inauguration, there were all kinds of themes uh, that I wanted to draw from. And it's a mixture of music from the faith tradition, sometimes music that I've composed, oftentimes uh, music composed by friends and partners of mine. Um, but oftentimes, it's just the fun of Wonderful. singing songs that we all know from the radio and that we love, that we might be singing together at a campfire. And while everybody's on mute, you can see the singing along. <laughs> uh, it's, it, and it is such a, a different way of orienting to having wow. the communal experience of singing with one another. We're used to the joy coming from hearing one another's voices. Right. And now comes the joy of seeing a little bit out of sync because that's how Zoom works, right? right. Yeah. I'm singing the song. I got the guitar in my head. I'm singing the song. And I can see everybody singing along with me just maybe about a second behind. But they're right. all linked up in one another. And they're, of course, hearing their voice matched with mine, but what they can see is their voice matched with everybody else's as well. Um, and this has just been one of a uh, of wide variety of ways that we've attempted to break through the, uh, the, the usual definition of what church or synagogue does yeah. um, and help people to feel more with one another. That's what it actually reminds me, our, our wonderful children and youth choir director, Jenny TC, um, you know, looked at, okay, what can we do? What can't we do during this time? And she came up with an idea of something I never thought I would be affiliated or associated with at all, which is a ukulele chorus. Um, and she realized that this was something that, you know, all that these kids could do. And so she got this whole group of kids uh, and is teaching them ukulele. And actually back when we could gather outside, they would sort of be able to get together in the park, socially oh, distant and masked and play ukulele. And it just is, you know, it's, you know, limitations um, ignite the creative part of our brain. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, one of the things that I think has been wonderful that I've seen, you know, across, you know, it's been the business world, it's the faith world, it's, it's the limitations of this pandemic. Um, you know, as human beings, we're brilliant. You know, this is, you know, this is part of being made in God's image. We're brilliant creators. And, and so, you know, you, you, you see that happening. And so it's why I love just, I love asking that question to other yeah. leaders, like what's been going on. Um, and, you know, the great thing about it is like, oh, you learn stuff and it gives you ideas about things. Oh, yeah, that we could, you know, we could try that here. Um, to that end, actually, one, uh, Mike, if, if it's okay, I just want to jump in with no, one go. other thing. There are so many examples that I could share with you about ways mm -hmm. we've created small group enabling, enabling people to connect with each other. But the one thing I wanted to mention that was really out of the box and um, was uh, such a, a thrill um, uh, one of our associate rabbis came up with the idea of what we ended up calling the Great Big Bridging Project in advance of the High Holy Days and the run up to the uh -huh. High Holy Days. That time where, like at Christmas or Easter, where the entire church community is coming together, um, the High Holy Days were coming and we knew that we were not going to be able to be in, in physical proximity to one another. And just the, the experience of being in that sanctuary expanded open to its fullest gills um, and knowing that we were going to be missing that was already looming as um, the absence was a presence. 
all its own. Right. And so um, we, we ended up working on a project. We had a member of our congregation who creates these really interesting sketch sculptures where hmm. there are these four-sided panels of like cardboard panels that he, he's an incredible artist. He does sketches on and then he appends them to each other to make effectively a sculpture of all these little small sketches. And so he was a part of this task force we came up with uh, creating that was just designed to dream how are ways that we can help people to feel more connected to one another as the holy days draw near. And we launched from that, the great big bridging project where we sent out one of these, actually a, a, a stack of these panels to every member of our congregation. And we said, "You, I don't want you to freak out if you're not a visual <laughs> artist, because I am, all of my artistic <laughs> right. ability, all of my artistic <laughs> ability is in the guitar. That that's it. Yeah. Um, it is yeah. not in any visual art whatsoever. And I know I know what it feels like to just be. Oh God, it's an art project, not me. Um, but yeah. what we said to people <laughs> yeah. was, uh, if you've got a photograph and you want to print mm. it out and put the photo on one of the panels, if you want to just print a word. Um, a Hebrew word, an English word, if you want to say something about your, uh, you want to put a photo of your family, what is it that's sustaining you during this period right. of time? We are going to collect, send it back to the temple. We're going to collect mm -hmm. them and make them into a giant sculpture. All of these yeah. appended to one another, a representation of mm. the sustaining Leo Beck temple at this time. And it is still... <sighs> People have not seen it in person. We, we ended up sending out photos. Really, it had to be a video because it's so massive. Right. We ended up having to uh, kind, of, kind of create a, a video scanning of it so you could begin to see all these little panels. Um, wow. because in many families, multiple members of the family created their own piece, sent it mm -hmm. in, and then all of it was put together. Um, but it's still on display in our social hall. And when the congregation comes back together again, um, you'll have the opportunity, uh, we will have the opportunity to see it in person, breathtaking. Oh, I wanna come, I wanna come see that. And that just, it, it's um, one, of, one of the things that we found is that like, you know, like Leo Beck, um, every community is blessed with, with artists. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we also have artists who've had the privilege of having their gifts nurtured in incredible ways. Uh, you know, but one of the things that we recognized right as the pandemic started is we have all these artists and musicians and actors and directors and filmmakers um, who were so busy all the time and then their work stopped. Yeah. Um, and, and so this was one of the opportunities of the pandemic is we were able to sort of gather an initial group and other people have been joining it since then um, and just said, you know, the, recognizing that churches uh, have been either the biggest promoters of the arts and the biggest censors of the arts throughout history. Um, but say, you know, we want to give you all the freedom to create at the intersection of the values of All Saints Church, what is happening in the world right now, and the, uh, you know, the, your artistic gifts. And, you know, the, the sort of the video things and other things that this group is coming up with. And you're right, it's these things like for, um, you know, in our tradition, uh, we begin the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. Yeah. Um, and there is, you know, the imposition, you know, of ashes on the forehead as a reminder of mortality um, and as a beginning of a penitential season. Well, usually the ashes come from burning the palms from Palm Sunday the year yeah. before. Well, we had, you know, we bought all these palms for Palm Sunday and then we didn't have Palm Sunday in the church. Right. And in fact, uh, they were sitting in my office. And at one point it was just like, what is that smell in my <laughs> office? And it's because the palms had molded. Of course. It was like, oh, we got to get rid of these things. And then we got rid of them. So we don't have them to burn. Um, and so they came up with this great idea. And actually you all are going to be hearing more about this and invited into it, which is saying, you know, we kind of been living from a Christian standpoint in Lent for the last 11 months. Yeah. Um, but to really think of it, what in my life do I need liberation from? What in my life needs transformation? Um, and we're going to invite people to write that on a piece of paper or a card or to email it in or to mail it in and we'll print it out. And then on the night before Lent, Shrove Tuesday, we're going to have a big fire. Um, and we're going to, you know, burn these things. And then after the ashes cool, of course, um, you know, for, you know, for ashes that are dropped off on Wednesday or people can come pick them up, they're going to be that piece. And it's going to be the idea that each of us is carrying the dream of transformation and liberation of each member of the community with us as we impose those ashes. And, and that's actually something that could, you know, we hope will become a tradition here, but we never would have thought of it yep. 
um, if we didn't have the palms to burn, because we just, oh, you just burned the palms the previous Sunday. But it was that limitation yeah. um, that that made us create. And I have got to come to Leo back when this pandemic is over and see what you're describing, because that just sounds um, that sounds amazing. Um, yeah, well, that project sounds that's so exciting, Mike. Um, what a beautiful moment, responsive adaptation of the tradition. What's so fabulous about what you guys are doing there is uh, both something that is uh, such a manifestation of moment, and is also mm -hmm. so deeply a part of the Episcopalian tradition. I mean, it's it's uh, right. that's beauty. I, that, that's really exciting to hear about. Well, and again, it's great. It's, you know, the wisdom, the wisdom lies in the community. And this is sort of the thing that I know you and I both know as leading congregations is if our congregations just ran on our creativity alone, it, it would be a disaster. <laughs> um, and we have these amazing creative communities and that's where God's breath, you know, breathes through. Um, you, you talked about sort of the adaptation piece. Um, one of the many gifts that I have experienced from Judaism is the centrality of home ritual. Yeah. Um, and, and it's something that we, we struggle with, at least as Episcopalian Christians, of taking, um, you know, we're really good when you get together and having liturgy, but in terms of what happens in the home, um, we struggle with that. And that is such a central part of Judaism. And as people have been in their homes, uh, sometimes by themselves, sometimes with families, um, it would seem to me that that would become even more important um, and yet I would also imagine you're looking at that differently during a pandemic. Can you talk a little about um, sort of home rituals and then also things like we've talked about the people who have died, who we've been able to come together. You know, some of these rituals, like when someone dies, involve the community coming together in the home and you can't get together. So yeah. uh, what, what are you learning? What have you learned? Yeah, it's uh, it's a, an important question because you are right. The, uh, the Jewish tradition, Jewish life is definitely a, kind of an interesting interspersion of things that you, you're you not supposed to do unless you're in community and things right. that you're really supposed to do on your own or in family. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll use, for instance, uh, I should actually add this, that it, it, right. most of the polling of American Jews uh, in contemporary times demonstrates that the home rituals are actually the ones that are most salient, that, that there are all kinds of Jews who mm. are not attached to synagogue, but they still have a Passover Seder in their homes, right. or they still light the Hanukkah candles at the time of Hanukkah. And the, the, the surveys, because they're not attached to uh, religious institutions, might see them as, quote, non-observant. But in point of fact, no. um, <laughs> some of them are observing Shabbat, the Sabbath, every mm -hmm. single week with a dinner and gathering and blessings with their family, um, but they're not uh, participating in broader community. And so obviously we are encouraging folks to be able to engage in both ways. Um, but, uh, but you're absolutely right about the centrality of that. We've attempted to equip people to live both of those realities, sometimes even simultaneously. I'll give you the best example. Mm, yeah. Um, as I think is probably going on uh, in so many churches as well, a lot of synagogues are seeing that if anything, uh, it, you know, we thought this might happen at the beginning of the pandemic, but you know, now a year in that it's still happening. That is increased attendance, increased participation um, in worship. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, I think uh, I, we assumed the gravity of the need, just the sudden, the suddenness of being plunged into mm -hmm. a pandemic, uh, people would turn to religious community. But the idea, I think what we're seeing now is folks are enjoying regularizing Shabbat and doing so pretty easily, right? You click a button and bang, you're there with us. Right. Um, and on top of it, um, you know, it removes the element in Los Angeles of traffic and combating uh, freeways in order to participate <laughs> with religious community. Um, but it also enables the fusing of those two elements of Shabbat. There are all kinds of members of our community who say, I love the few Shabbatot, the few Shabbat evenings that I'll come during the year. I really love participating, but our family has a strong custom of having Shabbat dinner with one another in which we make the table blessings and we share from our past week. And for us, that's the Sabbath. And so, um, mm. you know, we're just not going to be there very frequently on Shabbat evening at services. Um, what we've seen right. um, by the way we've gone about creating our Friday nights, at six o'clock, we have the table ritual set up as a Zoom uh, that's not a webinar. So you can actually see everybody, whoever comes, however many Zoom screens of folks, and we're lighting our candles together. We're doing the home stuff 
with one another in community. And so lighting the mm -hmm. candles, making the kiddush, bl the blessing over the wine, mm -hmm. blessing the meal. Um, and our thought is we, you know, at the end of that gathering, blessing family as well, there's a special blessing uh, for the love in our lives. And so for parents who are with oh. children, their hands are on their heads or arms around one another, um, just being able to see people physically connecting to one another when we can't. Oh. And for the members of our congregation, especially the elderly members of our congregation who are on their own and really are feeling the, the, the oh. depth of separation right now, just being able to see all of that connection and being a part of it um, is really rich. At the very end of those blessings, that's the first piece of the gathering. We then say, we're now going to move to doing the service, which is going to be more in webinar streaming type style. Um, but feel free to engage in your Shabbat dinner while you're praying right. with us. And now people are actually doing both of the uh, things. Um, we have so many folks who are really engaging in their home custom and their congregational custom all at the same time. Um, the same was true at Hanukkah. We came up with ways for people to um, engage with one another each of the nights of Hanukkah. Ordinarily, that's a, a home ritual. We send out materials right. to help people equipped to do it. But because we knew that some folks would not be able to gather with their loved ones to do it or with close friends, um, we also created an, an early evening opportunity. If you wanted to light your Hanukkah with us, um, with other members of the community, jump online, bang, we're there doing it with one another. And I, it'll remain to be seen how much of this uh, will end up being an, an ongoing adaptation for our community, but it's been a really, really important part of what we've gotten through this year. Well, and, and that's, and you start talking about that being ongoing, part of what we're talking about right now is recognizing that, um, you know, the, the more robust online presence, we've had a lot of online presence, but the much more robust online presence we have right now actually needs to continue. Yeah. Um, for a couple reasons. First of all, we have particularly elderly members of the congregation yeah. um, who are becoming connected in new ways um, and also may not feel safe coming back into community uh, face to face. The other thing which is incredible that we're finding, and I wonder if you're finding this at Leo Beck, is we're attracting new members from way outside the LA area. Um, our last new members class, our Getting Connected class, you know, had someone in it from Florida who's never been to All Saints Church. We, yeah. we have um, an amazing person uh, from Addis Ababa. She actually runs the, the UN uh, COVID response for Ethiopia and, um, yeah. and has started coming to our 1 p.m. service and is now one of our lay readers. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we can't just sort of say when the pandemic's over, see you later. Absolutely. Um, and so it's like, you know, we're gonna have a chance to say, okay, how do we do this? And then also, how do we like have realistic conversations about what our capacity is uh, to, 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 to do everything? Um, what, one of the gifts that this has been for me, and it makes me feel like, God, I got I, I looked at your uh, your home to home and, it, and I love how you've like put like you have season two right now. Um, <laughs> exactly. and you, you're, pro, you're like programming it like a TV channel, which I thought that's brilliant. I actually showed it to our communication staff. Um, but it makes me realize like usually my life is so consumed by All Saints Church that all I can do is pay attention to All Saints Church and what's happening in this congregation. Yeah. Um, and yet one of the gifts of the pandemic for me is mostly through social media, um, I am able to, you know, a dear friend of mine, Susan Talvey, who's a rabbi in, in St. Louis, you know. Susan's you know, Susan amazing. And, and Jim Goodman. Yeah. Uh, Susan and, and, and Jim every day do something called Psalms for Healing and Jim gets out his guitar and they just do a brief sort of, and it just, that's become something I log into regularly. And I wanna to come to your, your sing-along. It's like, I can do that. And, and I wonder if there is an opportunity here yeah. um, for us to say, like, I don't have to drive all the way to Leo Beck Temple now, you know, and fight traffic on the 405 to get there. And you don't have to drive all the way to All Saints Church yep. um, that we can come together uh, in some new ways here, which I think could be, uh, could be quite interesting. Um, and, and learn from each other and have fun with each other. Uh, we're starting to get some questions in. Catherine asks, how has the temple responded to the racial justice mobilizations from the summer? Is there a racial justice element of the temple's work? Yeah, great question. And um, I'm gr grateful for it because this is certainly something I was hoping to get a chance to talk about here mm -hmm. today. Um, obviously, I know that racial justice work is central to the spirit of All Saints Church, as it yep. is to the Obeck Temple, always has been. As you were saying before, Mike, uh, these are things that uh, transcend any one rector or any one senior rabbi. Um, obviously, we are grateful, as we spoke about at the beginning of this uh, rector's forum, uh, to uh, the giants who came before us and paved this way. But the reality is uh, this is going to be going on at Leo Beck Temple and All Saints Church long after you and I aren't leading those communities. Right. Um, and so 
So uh, we're doing our part and uh, proud to do so. It is, um, I would say, if anything, uh, our community organizing work right now, our, our core justice work is probably more deeply uh, rooted around racial justice work than any other facet. We've got mm -hmm. some interesting things going on on a lot of different fronts justice-wise. Um, homelessness work has always been really important in the congregations. There's a lot of different fronts. Um, but uh, I would say that the, the racial justice front in all of its different faces when it comes to immigration and asylum, mm -hmm. when it comes to criminal justice reform, restorative justice, um, uh, incarceration reform, all of this um, is pretty much what we're throwing the greatest amount of our energy um, these days. We see um, uh, the racial justice piece, uh, the, the question of reform, especially on the criminal justice front, as sort of the mm. beginning of the trickling out to all the other places where the manifestations of uh, systemic racism uh, rear, rears its ugly head. Um, and so um, we're blessed right now, Leo, but it happens to be kind of a halcyon time on this front because one of our rabbis on our team, uh, his name is Rabbi Benjamin Ross, he mm. had a 15-year career as a community organizer, one of the leading community organizers for the Jewish community before he went to rabbinical school. So wow. he was already known throughout the, the, the American Jewish community as a social justice organizer, um, a leading one. And then he went to rabbinical school and then we snapped him up and brought him to Leo Beck Temple. Um, yep. And uh, so he is now uh, at the forefront of guiding our community organizing leadership team, which charts the course uh, for this work in our congregation. And because of his, his personal, both his experience and how to organize successfully, but also the depth of relationships that he has with leaders across the faith spectrum. Uh, you know, the, uh, you mentioned before LA Voice being such an important and faith yeah. in action, the PICO na National Network right. of which LA Voice is a part. Um, you know, Rabbi Ross's relationships uh, throughout the state, throughout the country on that front are just invaluable to us in terms of exactly as you were describing before, deepening the or extending the reach of our work. You know, we, 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 met, we muster power by appending to like-minded mm -hmm. folks uh, who are willing to uh, set aside whatever the small uh, distinctions there may be between uh, an Episcopalian church and a, uh, right. an Islamic uh, mosque and a synagogue uh, and the reform movement. Say, so, okay, well, you know, the differences are actually not so important. We're actually swimming in a common current right now. And that's how we marshal power. Um, he just has extraordinary uh, experience in doing so. And so, yes, we, um, this has been on a lot of different fronts. The, the, the big breakthrough for us uh, in this area uh, legislatively was the Trust Act back in 2013, 14, I think it was, um, was uh, the first big piece of statewide work we did on this front. And that cultivated a relationship all the way up to Governor Brown's office. And he actually contacted me when he was attempting to get uh, Prop 57 onto the ballot just a few years ago, the one for uh, prison reform. Right. Uh, and uh, he, it was really inspiring. He, you know, he has an extraordinary Jesuit background, uh, Governor Brown, former Governor Brown. Right. And he, call, he calls me up and he starts talking to me the language of tshuva, of, uh, using the language <laughs> of Jewish repentance, saying, uh, we have a criminal justice system right now that does not uh, leave space for uh, proper restoration. Uh, for restorative justice to be an, an element of uh, how one say it's not it's supposed to just be about uh, throwing people away and locking locking them up and throwing away right. the key. Um, and so I was really moved to hear the governor of California speaking this way from a, from a vantage point of faith. And we uh, brought together a large network of rabbis first and then faith leaders to uh, attempt to get the measure onto the ballot. The big reason he was reaching out was because it was coming about fairly late in the game uh, if, to get the necessary number of signatures. Uh, uh, to get it onto the ballot. And so we, uh, the faith community, I think, jumped in uh, very heavily to make that happen. Ultimately, that measure passed. This past election cycle, we um, were uh, one of our, um, well, two of our most important uh, organizing, both of our most important organizing priorities on the ballot were racial justice related. Um, one was Prop 15, which regrettably did not pass. Uh, we uh, officially yeah. 
endorsed that proposition as a congregation. Um, and that was schools and communities first aimed yep. at uh, ensuring that uh, proper resources so right now, the distinction between what a school looks like for most white Los Angelinos and what it looks like for communities of color, um, this would have been uh, greatly addressed, unfortunately did not pass. But uh, opposing Prop 20 was the other priority and right. that did <laughs> in fact succeed. We managed to uh, beat back uh, this uh, effort to start to chip away at the important achievements that we've achieved in the recent years in California with regard to the Trust Act, with regard to uh, racial profiling and policing work, with regard to uh, the criminal justice reform that Prop 57 and other measures brought about. And so uh, uh, this has been at the very center. I, I should add, uh, I talked about immigration. Um, in addition yeah. to the advocacy work, Wheelback Temple uh, early on in its uh, attachment to the immigration work, especially in the Trump administration, um, adopted one uh, Im uh, one uh, immigrant family and one uh, uh, asylum family. So two separate families mm. that we were working with to navigate the system, to ensure that they would have financial resources, um, legal resources, counsel, um, and support, uh, language help. I mean, all the different things that we, know. we wow, felt it was important awesome. for our, our community to actually have relationships um, where mm -hmm. we could hear once we, it wasn't about putting them on display for a long time. In fact, they never spoke within the congregation, but only after the relationships were deepened and seasoned, um, it became important for our members to get a chance up close and personal with a family that's really a part of our community, um, yeah. albeit not neither of them are Jewish families, um, but, a, but part of our community to be able to actually help us see with new eyes what it is uh, to be a, a person of color attempting to immigrate to this country, attempting to uh, gain uh, the, one, as I said, undocumented immigrant family and the other um, an asylum family. I'm still working uh, very closely with those two families. That's wonderful. Yeah, and actually, part of why sometimes I'll have a pre-interview with with the guest for a forum, and actually didn't want to do this with you because I wanted us to have these moments of discovery live. Yeah. Um, so we could do this. Um, part of what's happened here for us at All Saints Church, first of all, the, you know, the the rabbi that you're talking about on your staff, we're actually, you know, we're looking for our version of that right now. We we did a restructuring this year. We had to cut our budget by about twenty percent. Yeah. Um, because of the economic of uh, situation that we have here, and also looking at what's going to be sustainable down the road. And um, it also was an, a, a wonderful moment of mission clarity for us. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's what happens is, you know, economic situations help you decide what are we really about. And, and for us at All Saints and, and our leadership team, you know, our vestry has been incredible and our wardens have been amazing and our staff and everyone is just saying, you know, this work of racial justice is this is our generation's work. Yep. Um, and, and obviously it's been going on way before us and it will continue to go on after us. And there is something that there is, there is a moment that is happening, uh, an extended moment in this country that is a reckoning about this. And, uh, and this, is, this needs to be a focal point. So we're looking for an associate rector who will do in many ways what it sounds like this rabbi is doing for you, focusing yep. uh, our work on this. And then this actually gets to a question, uh, Joseph asks something about uh, interfaith dialogue, the crucial yep. importance of deeper Jewish Christian dialogue. Um, and what thoughts do we have for that? And this is actually something I think that I would love for our two communities to work together on. For sure. We have the, the beginnings of an idea and really I don't want it to be more than that because I, I don't want it to be something that all saints forms. Um, and our, our working title for it is a movement architecture project. Uh. Um, and par part of, we've been working with a really wonderful uh, activist named Andre Henry. Uh, and Andre works with a guy named Serge Popovich, who was one of the people who helped get Milosevic overthrown in Serbia. Oh, wow. And um, what, what they, and also Lauren Grubaugh, who's a former um, parishioner and seminarian of ours, really looking at what does it mean to build a social movement that actually accomplishes something and makes change, that has a strategy, that looks at the pillars that uphold oppression and, uh, and really targets those and replaces them with something else. Um, that, that, that really, I mean, I've always been um, so attracted to the Jewish principle of the repair of the world, to Kun Olam, yeah. um, that, that looks at that. And so we want to gather a group of people um, from Christian tradition, Jewish tradition, Muslim tradition, perhaps other traditions. would love to have you and people from Leo Beck be a part of this and start off by saying, can we articulate a, a theological foundation, a multi-faith theological foundation for dismantling white supremacy and anti-black racism and building beloved community. 
um, that, that any faith community can organize around, that it's not just for Christians or Jews or Muslims. Um, and then really take a strategic approach to say, what would it mean to build a multi-faith movement that actually has strategies and goals uh, yeah. to do something uh, you know, about this and to work with our partners at LA Voice. It's why we're so interested in doing more work with Zach Hoover and LA Voice uh, about that and, and, and to look at that. And, and part of what we're, as we're listening to each other and listening out there, part of what we're recognizing is at least for us, um, an initial piece of that needs to not just be imagining where we're going, but looking at where we've been. So we're, you know, we're looking at things like the stained glass windows in our church, all white faces. How did we get there? What's the story behind that? You know, the land that our church sits on, um, you know, originally uh, the Tongva people, members of the Tongva nation sat on this land, but don't anymore. How did we get here? Um, and so to have that self-understanding, to listen to other voices out in the community, um, and then to hold that up to our values and then say, okay, if that is our story, how do we write a new story? But not just all saints doing that together. So, um, well, that's exciting. I would love to, that, that is really, I mean, really I mean, exciting. I would love to, think to about. continue to have conversations um, with you all and and see what you know. Not to sort of say, hey, you join what we're doing at All Saints. Right. That's not. Yeah. But but to say, can we get people together and say, you know, where is where is spirit moving? Yeah. Um, and calling us because again, if it's just you know, we have, we're very limited. If it's just All Saints ideas, that's very limited. But if we get an incredible diverse group around the table, yeah. um, there's no end uh, to, to, to what we can do. And, and, and we'll probably find that other communities it's like, oh yeah, we did that work. Yeah. And here's how we did it. And here's, here's what we learned. Um, and, and so I, you know, my, my bias towards multi-faith dialogue um, is that it's important and it has to have an end more than just talk. Um, right. Because I know at least Episcopalians, as when I was in campus ministry, as a student of mine says, you talk and then you talk about talking and then you talk about talking about talking. Well, that's a Jewish specialty. What are you talking that's about, right. <laughs> See, we have so much in common. <laughs> uh, so, um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's becoming clear to us and it's been clear to a lot of people, you know, long before us that, uh, particularly this work of racial reconciliation um, is this, this is our generation's work and it's work that we all share. For sure. So, I, and it's, yeah. it's really exciting. I, obviously, you know, one of the things that's been really fun over the years is um, like waves, uh, the mm -hmm. partnership between all saints church and Leo Beck temple finds a new manifestation, finds a new moment and a new voice. And I, mm -hmm. I it's really, I'm not a, even slightly surprised, but delighted that uh, it sounds like our justice focuses um, are really effectively right down the same the same alley and uh yeah that kind of conversation and uh undergirding the ways in which uh uh what the faith story is the unifying faith story in this at this moment in time could be uh really inspiring and energizing for both communities and uh again append us not only to each other but to so many others and uh finding the power to make make it make it happen yeah um uh, love to jump on on something else um been working with uh you gotta meet her someday a dear friend of ours uh, becca stevens who's a, a pastor in in nashville who started something called thistle farms which is a community of women recovering from prostitution violence and drug abuse and oh my wow um, Be Be becca's mind is always working and um she's in nashville and they had the christmas day bombing um in nashville which really destroyed this whole neighborhood that had been part of the country music industry and her husband is a, a country music hall of fame um singer songwriter yeah. Um, and she went down and spent some time in the rubble and began to think about theologically the whole idea of rubble and realizing that this is kind of where we are as a nation and a people right now. Yeah. Um, that the pandemic um, and, and all the just what we just talked about in terms of our, our racial divides, um, there is so much of our lives that is rubble. Uh, and yet she used the image of the you know, we know from the fires here that there are pine trees that only the cones only release their seeds in fire. Right. Um, and what does it mean? And she started using this term and we're thinking and praying about it together of the whole idea of rubble, but also of remnant of what are the remnants of our lives and, and remnant is a very Jewish concept Yeah. Um, as well. And so uh, I just, you know, we didn't prepare for this, but I'm just sort of wondering 
um, you know, is this something that, uh, th that you've been thinking of? And then also, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, grief and, you know, George Regas died and we have not yet been able to come together to grieve his death. You know, I've got an altar set up in my office that now has five urns on it from people yeah. who are were just waiting for the, for the burials. Um, what has been your experience of remnant, of rubble, of grief, um, and, and and what can emerge out of this? And where do we draw on our traditions for that? Yeah, it's such a, wow, hard, hard to think about and painful to commune with yeah. the elements that are coming to mind. Um, you know, my, my heart breaks every single time another, I mean, this is always the case. It's always sad for a family when there's a loss in our congregation, but when it takes yeah. place during this past year, um, right. my own mentor as a rabbi, uh, who's now the, the president of the reform movement uh, worldwide of the reform movement of Judaism, Rabbi Rick Jacobs. He was my senior rabbi when I was an associate rabbi at Westchester Reform Temple in Scarsdale, New York, um, before I came to Leo Beck. His mom died out here. He's in New York. His mom died out here uh, in, I think, May. Um, uh, she lives in the lived in the San Diego area. And, you know, here's my mentor, who's been one of the most influential rabbis in North America. And he's watching his mother's burial taking place on a screen. Uh, and it's just unthinkable. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he contacts me to help to lead a shiva gathering, an in-home gathering on screen, yeah. uh, which I did, uh, and was obviously honored to do. Um, but I, I found myself, I can't even imagine what this would have been like for him. Thank God I haven't experienced the personal loss of that sort. I have obviously experienced many personal losses of people I cherish in our congregation during this year, mm -hmm. um, but uh, not the same as it is for those who it's been their mother, it's been their spouse, it's been their child, um, their sibling. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's just a, a lot of raw grief and I feel like the remnant um, where I, where I'm focusing at the moment is I, I'm, I'm concerned about the ways in which this is, this experience we're going through is becoming normalized. That to me mm. is the, the great concern. Um, I think we're, we, we, I, I'm always heartbroken when I hear from a member of our community who talks about feeling, uh, like they're uh, really distraught, feeling lonely. And yet I think about all the different things I know the church is doing too, um, to help to bridge that gap and to give them a sense right. of connection to others, both within the congregation and beyond. But what really gets to me is when someone says, actually, it's, it's not so bad. You know, it's, it's pretty yeah. easy. I could connect, you know, on to things that I want to see. And uh, I don't, I can keep my pajamas on all the time. And uh, it's pretty simple to, you know, be a part of things. And I think to myself, what will synagogue, church, mosque, wow. religious community be when this is over? How many people will yeah. opt not to engage in person? Yeah. This yeah. is what keeps me awake at night right yeah. now. Um, and of course, I want to come up with ways to nourish. I agree with you entirely, Mike. We're going to have to come up with ways to sustain the best of what we've, by right. dint of circumstance, invented during this period of time. And yet I don't want to do so to the effect of in any way devaluing that it is worth putting yourself out to experience human touch and proximity again. And I'm worried about the ongoing sociological, psychological, emotional, spiritual yeah. remnants of this time. Yeah, there's, there is, you know, there's a level of incarnation in both of our faith traditions. Yeah. And, you know, for us as followers of Jesus, so much, you know, we look at that and so much of his ministry involved touch. Right. And, and, and this was, um, this was something that, that I thought of, well, you know, as, as we had people die in the congregation and particularly after George Floyd was murdered, there are these moments and our instinct in these moments is to physically come together as a community. And, and yet not only are we not able to do that, we're actually being conditioned to fear that. Exactly. Um, and the fear is, and, and there's enough fear in the water anyway. Yep. Um, and the fear is so powerful and, and yet I think that, th and, and this, this is where I really appreciate, like, you know, we're staying away from each other. We're doing all the public health stuff that we need to be doing. And I'm not indifferent 
to the other public health ramifications yep. of doing this. Yep. Um, and, and, and that particularly because there are so many people who also have abuse histories on top of this, you know, for whom touch and proximity is already fearful and threatening. Yep. So, you know, the, you know, I'm really like, we're, we're blessed with, with, with Sally Howard and our staff who is a trauma therapist in addition to being a priest. Yeah. I'm really thinking that, you know, we're going to need to look at coming out of this from a trauma informed perspective um, to say, how can we rebuild trust in touch? Yeah. How can we rebuild trust in incarnation and in being together? Um, but then also look at there. I mean, we have a human need for touch and to say, OK, so what are we substituting for that right now? And, and, it, it, and because a lot of it involves screens, which we already had addictive relationships with, yep. um, are we in essence substituting something that is really healthy and life-giving, which is good touch, safe touch, loving exactly. touch, for something that has incredible addictive qualities, yep. um, which is sort of the screen culture and the, di the, 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 the surface connection, but the broader disconnection. Yep. Uh, of internet relationships. And I think this is something where communities of faith, it's going to be incredibly important because yep. this is not just a public health question. It's an ethical question. It's a theological question. Um, and I feel like we need to draw from the, the, the riches of all of our traditions. Well, I, I will lend you one then uh, that, that yeah. has been weighing on my mind so much from yeah. the early rabbinic tradition in the early writing, the very earliest collection of rabbinic writings goes back about 1800 years ago. It was called the Mishnah. And in the Mishnah, mm -hmm. um, one of the great maxims in uh, the, that early collection of rabbinic writings says, and before I actually share the quote, I want to share with you yeah from a standpoint of context, one of the things I think we're gonna to need to articulate to people is that being a part of a religious community requires that I don't only think about what it is I wish to get by being in proximity from yeah. the religious community, but what it is others need my proximity for. That if I don't, if I choose to just exist in the congregation on screen, I may be able to get the things that I am seeking. The problem is I'm not creating for others the things. And right now we are. I think we're using, we're doing, yeah. at least we're doing it in the way that is safe and appropriate. Um, and uh, we too are not meeting, uh, we, we're, you know, everything is by Zoom right now. And yet right. when public health doesn't demand that anymore, and you're right, that, that by then that, uh, that learned fear of being mm -hmm. in proximity to one another um, Choosing to be in community, in proximity for others, not only for myself, because there can't be a collective without my being. It's the same reason we vote, right? You know, I know your congregation and ours as well, huge voter engagement drive mm -hmm. um, and the growing toward a 100% voting congregation. Right. Why? Because my vote doesn't matter all that much. It is rare that any election is won by one vote. And yet, mm -hmm. If we all vote, that is the reason, that's the, that, then I know that there's something that is commonly held. And the same is true in religious community, only more deeply and more emotionally, more spiritually. And so um, I think about this teaching from the Brunic tradition. Um, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only mm. for myself, what am I? And if not now, oh. when? Um, those three elements. We have to be able to meet our own spiritual needs or else the entire enterprise comes apart. And yet, if it is entirely about that and nothing but that, um, truly, what are we? And every moment is the if not now, not, if not now, when moment. This one, obviously, unique in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it, you, you, you talking like this reminds me, and it was, I, I mentioned Susan Talvey before, Rabbi Talvey. And... Um, she, I, I've learned this from lots of people, including my own parents, because I grew up in a multi-faith household. Um, and, and one of the things I learned from my parents is um, you don't try to find the least common denominator between faiths. Um, you create a, a, a container of love that allows each to be so deeply who they are and invest so deeply in their faith um, and honor and protect the other. Um, and, and so it's, we, we had, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, 
one of our, one of our parishioners, uh, Amy Browneman, gave a, an interview um, about the separation of church and state um, and, and the importance of that with a magazine. But what she, and of course, now that I'm trying to find it, it doesn't coming up, here it is. Um, here it is. And, but you know, she talked about um, religious freedom. And this is what she said. She said, um, religious freedom has an external meaning, protecting one another's journey, um, but an internal meaning as well. I myself have the freedom to learn, to change, to grow. Religion, philosophical inquiry and spiritual practice are not set in stone, they're fluid. And in a respectful culture, there is support and inclusion for all. Um, and, and what I love about uh, what we have inherited from our predecessors um, in the faith, in our congregations, and in our faith is that sense of we're not just here for ourselves. Yeah. Um, we're here to protect each other's journey. And one of the things that Susan taught me is um, she's like, I want you to be the most devout follower of Jesus Christ that you can be. Um, uh, and I will protect you as you do that. And I need you to stand and protect me uh, to be the most devout Jew that I can be. Um, and you know, she would invite me the same way you invite me to Leo Beck, she would invite me to Central Reform Congregation and would not feel the need to change or apologize for anything no. when I showed up. Um, and I felt so honored to be invited into that community and, and be able to just even take a sip from the depths of the well. Yeah. Uh, of that faith. And so, you know, I, I look at all the things that we're facing and, you know, we can't afford to have um, the least common denominator. We need the richness and the depths of, of each of our traditions. So true. Um, and, and just, and, and, and that's also where the joy is, yeah. you know, I, like, I, you know, I, you know, I love hearing you talk about your faith um, and, and it, it, it makes me look at my faith differently and, and, and more deeply. We got to wrap up really quickly. Um, someone asked for you to say a word about the tapestry behind you. Yes, I also saw. Like I, I, yeah, yeah. I will say it real quickly. I also saw earlier a quick question about: Is there a video of the great big, yes. big, great yeah. big bridging project? The answer is. We did make a video that we sent out to the membership. I'll have to do some digging to see if I can come up with it. But uh, if I can find that, that little pan around it, um, I'll be happy to share it with your community as well. Um, and as for the uh, little tapestry behind me. Um, this was a gift, congregational group that traveled uh, uh, to Israel this many years ago now, probably about 10 years ago, maybe more. Um, and incidentally, I also saw the question about Israel-Palestine work, and that is, is, will always yep. be a central focus for us. Yep. Leo Beck, as I know, it has been at All Saints, and we've done a fair amount of collaborating over the years in that uh, terrain as well. Um, but uh, yeah, this tapestry was from a congregation that we visited in Haifa, in the northern part of Israel, um, on our trip. Haifa is really well known as being uh, one of the the greatest example, probably the greatest example uh, in Israeli cities of coexistence work, incredible mm. coexistence work between uh, Palestinian Israeli citizens um, and uh, Jewish Israeli citizens. Um, and it's a, a kind of an exemplar for how better to uh, create a, a life of uh, independent meaning uh, for both peoples and so, um, and related meaning. Um, so Yes, uh, the uh, the tapestry was a gift from that congregation when we were there, and it's been up in my home ever since. I've been using it effectively as the bima, the altar of our congregation. Yep. Once we've been on screen, it represents the seven days of creation in the book of Genesis, mm -hmm. starting with day one over here and ending with day seven, the Sabbath uh -huh. over here. Um, and uh, it's uh, it has created a sense of uh, of sacred space for our congregation. And today uh, I brought it to share with all of you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, thanks for being, we could have gone on forever. And I know I'm getting the, I'm getting the wrap it up from Ken, <laughs> from, uh, from uh, Keith Holman, our director. Um, and looking forward to hearing you preach at our 1115 service. Uh, we're going to take just a few minutes. Folks have been in Children's Chapel and in our meditative chapel. Ken, thank you so much. And, Very much uh, my pleasure. To, thank you. To be continued. You bet. Take okay. care. Love you, brother. Love you too.